Hello everyone, welcome to lecture number two. We're going to talk a lot about ethics today and before we get right into it let's do a few course reminders. Um, I would like everybody to go to the course survey which is available at this link. It will be on uh, the slides you can click it from there and it's also in an announcement which uh, was posted before class even began. So this survey just lets us find out a little bit more about you as a person and what you're into and what your interests are uh, and we're also going to use data from this survey as demonstration data throughout the course. So please participate so you can see visualizations of all of your classmates uh, pet preferences and such like that. So uh, I also wanted to remind you that Reading 1 is going to be due not this Friday, next Friday, the 16th. Um, so, and there is no discussion section this week. It's going to begin next week in week two. Well, uh, as speaking of reading number one, um, it's going to be this 50 years of data science. It's a fairly lengthy document. Give yourself some time. So make sure you start it soonish. When you're reading, please consider these points. If you come up, if during reading you find things you hadn't previously thought about, whether you agree with all the points on here and which ones do you disagree with, because I'm pretty sure there'll be at least a couple. If there's anything you don't understand, it's good to ask those questions in section. And what points or topics do you think are missing in a discussion of data science? So um, please go ahead, use these bullet points and the others I didn't read off and let's talk about these in discussion before you go through the reading. So clicker questions. Nope, no clicker. We're going to do this with Kaltura's tools. Hopefully everything works pretty well and it translates fairly directly. If not, I apologize. So, so. all right, so as I said, we're going to talk about ethics and particularly privacy today. There's even more, though, in ethics than just data privacy, and we'll talk about that here in a second. So before we get into actual lecture, let's take a look at a few of your opinions before we hear anything from me. So here's a statement that people may disagree with. If the data have been freely shared on the internet, it's okay to use them for my project please respond with the Kaltura thing. Here's another response we're asking for. Police forces should have access to genetic databases when attempting to identify a criminal. Please give your agreement or disagreement with this. Social media and other uh, online types should be allowed to experiment on their users. Do you agree or disagree? Okay, thanks for filling out those. Let's see if what we learned today changes how you feel about any of those points. So we're going to determine how data scientists can address ethical concerns and maximize data privacy. As I said a second ago, the topics about ethics and data science go well beyond privacy. This is a, one way to look at all of them in a kind of taxonomy, but I'm sure that there are things that are missing here that other people would be right to point out as important topics. So just for a starter, obviously we have the philosophy and morality of ethics themselves, which is a totally separate study from data science but these studies have relevance to people who are actually doing things out in the world. Um, the problems in data collection is roughly speaking where we're going to concentrate today's lecture on. There's elements here like the privacy of people's data, whether your data correctly represents underrepresented groups like minorities, or if you're sampling well. So for instance, if you're doing a political campaigns uh, polling, and you only sample people from your own party, you're going to get an inaccurate uh, understanding of people's opinions. And if you try to sell that as something other than what it is, that may be an ethical concern. 
So, and oftentimes we have issues where people use analyses in ways that they can't actually address the claim, right? And sometimes that's the analyst who's uh, operating incorrectly there, and sometimes it's the way people use the data and the analysis provided incorrectly. And there's also similar questions of privacy and data set reuse. Now, algorithmic fairness and machine bias is definitely a growing field right now. Um, you will find that there's all kinds of stuff out there on the internet where, um, like, the face detection software that some cameras use has a hard time picking up black people's faces. Oops, that can lead to all kinds of problems, and it's, is it because the engineers didn't use a good sample of black people in their data set they used to train the face detector? Uh, is is a issue of algorithmic fairness due to uh, the fact that historically black people have been discriminated against and it's these kinds of algorithms just cement bad things that are already happening in the uh, in the society these are things that people will talk about deeply and it's really difficult to give a full accounting of this right here we are going to revisit this topic a little bit in a future uh, discussion of algorithms so there's a lot of social implications when we operate at large scales, right? The, the things that a Facebook and a YouTube can do can affect society at a global level. And that is just a function of their incredible reach. We're going to talk just a little bit about that today. And finally, we have issues of accountability. When these things go wrong, is it you, the data scientist or machine learning engineer who's at fault? Is it your boss? Is it the machine's fault? You know, we have to understand who is supposed to be taking responsibility and in what way for these systems. Um, there's issues here like if ML systems make a decision and nobody knows how they make a decision, right? The interpretability of things can be a problem as well as the transparency of how systems were built. We're going to talk very briefly about that today. Okay, so. To start with, uh, as I was saying, big data are really, really big, right? Um, if, yeah. hello, there we go. So yeah, so yeah, big data are big. This paper in 2014 was already showing this incredible progression of the fact that up till 2003, all of society had collected maybe 5 billion gigabyte of data. And as we went through into 2015, we were starting to generate that amount of data for all of society's history until 2003, every 10 seconds or so. And this problem is only getting worse. So um, here is an infographic from 2020. Now, first off, I just want to say I am going to I'm going if I die and you guys make infographics like this, my ghost is coming back to haunt you because this is a terrible infographic, and we will uh, cover some of that in data visualization later uh, in another uh, lecture. But just to point out this little chunk right here that in 2019 this infographic claims that 4.4 zettabytes was the entire amount of data that humanity had generated. And this year, we have a factor of 10 on that. Now, I don't know the sourcing on all this, but if you look around this infographic, the numbers seem vaguely reasonable, but potentially made up or potentially old. But it's very interesting when you look at the sheer scale of the number of tweets and Facebook photos and stuff like that. Okay, so data at that kind of scale can quite reasonably create problems, okay? Um, technology is reaping huge benefits, possibility to give us huge benefits as individuals, organizations. We can do things that make everybody happy in one sense, but that's only if they're used properly and efficiently without uh, human failings, let alone machine ones, right? So that's why there are questions being raised about analytics, because 
this this is inevitable. We are human beings, and the systems we create also are fallible. So let's start with an example of how the scale of the data that we're talking about can lead to societal effects. So YouTube is a place where a lot of people spend their time. And anybody who's done a few videos knows that the recommender system will pretty quickly start delivering more of what you've looked at. The thing is, is that the recommender system is built to do two things. One, first and foremost, it wants to keep you on the site. It wants to keep you engaged with the material. So it tends to prefer things which are sticky and generate a lot of engagement. So maybe something controversial, something that people are going to agree or disagree with. It doesn't matter because people are going to click on it. They're going to anger click or they're going to click and, you know, cheer. So, uh, so the, the YouTube algorithm has a definite preference for things that generate controversy. And because it exposes you to something, so you start off on a topic and it's going to recommend something similar to what you just looked at, but also it's going to tend to prefer something that's very engaging and potentially controversial, right? So you're going to click on that. And if you're hooked, you're going to click on another in a similar vein. And pretty soon there's a pipeline that leads you potentially from something relatively mundane into something dark and extreme, because you're going to keep going on this topic, but you're going to be seeing more and more engaging, controversial, potentially upsetting material. And it's been documented that this definitely can lead users through the recommendation system down into quite extreme political behavior uh, over the course of weeks or months. This link from the New York Times here is a story about one person's journey that way that is very thorough and a very good look for people who are interested in this topic. So what are the ethics of dealing with data? Well, it probably starts probably helps to start with defining ethics at all. And as I hinted at, there's a lot of philosophy and stuff like that that um, can be considered in this, but we have to stick with the simple stuff here. So the dictionary, we know that these kinds of things are, they're not about laws, right? This is not a legal framework. This is not about what somebody tells you to do because otherwise you'll be punished by people. It's about what you should do and shouldn't do. They are societally given and they're about right and wrong, right? So how does right and wrong apply to data? Well, it's particularly interesting maybe when we uh, run up against a problem of data ethics that gets confounded with a problem of regular ethics. Okay, so back in 2015, there was a website that was dedicated to getting people who wanted to cheat on their spouses to hook up. Ashley Madison um, got hacked, and the hackers took the usual credit card information, but they also started blackmailing people, you know, saying if you don't pay us so much money, then we're going to expose the fact that you were trying looking to cheat on your spouse. Um, this was a very big deal in the world of data privacy and data ethics. And it's interesting how everybody, like the, the common take on it may have been colored by how you thought about the people who were on Ashley Madison. Well, turns out that even more normal daters are not immune. So OkCupid, the same uh, dating site that we looked at back in lecture one, also got hacked. And this one was problematic, not just because the people are maybe, you know, more morally agreeable to other people, but because this kind of data is unique in its identifiability. So as we mentioned back in lecture one, OkCupid likes to have their users answer questions, right? So the idea is like kind of like a get to know you, an icebreaker. So what was your childhood pet's name? Right? 
people might put that out on OkCupid. Um, and it turns out that data like that are, is very useful for breaking security questions when you're trying to hack somebody's uh, accounts at their bank, say, right? What is your, you know, these kinds of things are not foreseeing circumstances of putting your data out there online in a place that you thought was kind of semi-private, but then somebody else can grab a hold of that data and you do something with it you didn't think could be done, unforeseen. Um, another issue, of course, is that, again, because this felt like a semi-private thing where you were just doing dating, you might have shared elements of your sexuality that you weren't comfortable sharing with the whole world, and now that elements are out there. So um, there's a lot of questions about why this 2016 hack was not more of a warning, because these things just keep going on and on. This kind of data breach is uh, still common today, and people are always surprised by it. So. Another kind of different problem is that courts are using artificial intelligence to do things that affect your sentencing. So there's a system called Compass, which uses a black box of a machine learning algorithm. The company that makes it claims that it was trained on loads and loads of data of uh, court cases and offenders and reoffenders, And the idea is that it's supposed to be able to predict and when somebody comes up for sentencing, what is their risk of reoffending, right? And you want to uh, give somebody a harsher sentence if it's fairly likely that they're going to reoffend. You can also use the Compass system for probation, I believe, and probation hearings. Um, the problem is this: nobody knows how the system works, or at least nobody outside of the company's engineers. So it makes a determination that, you know. Uh, Alice should go to jail for four years and Bob should go to jail for seven years. The circumstances of the crime look relatively the same to everybody else. So what is it about Alice and Bob that result in different sentences? You can't put the machine learning system on the court's docket to ask it why. It just is completely non-transparent. Um, so there's issues here of algorithmic fairness about whether the algorithm might be picking up uh, just historical inequities in over sentencing of black people compared to non uh, to compared to white populations, right? Uh, there may be issues where the you know the the whole thing is doing things arbitrarily, but we can't see because it's not transparent. So there's a lot of interesting questions around systems like this, and they have huge impacts in people's lives. Um, and then most recent, uh, fairly recently, there was a massive theft of information from the credit bureau, Equifax, which affects everybody, basically, who was old enough to have a credit card at that time. Uh, I don't know if any of you got, the pro got uh, hacked that way. My, my account certainly was and I never had had any kinds of identity theft issues before, but I have had since. So it's definitely the case that data privacy, protecting data, is a huge deal, as is the use of data when we uh, don't expect the consequences of it, right? Here's another one. Uh, everybody now is into uh, wearables, you know, your Apple Watch maybe you've got, or a Fitbit. Oops, turns out that a lot of information about the physical layout of secret military bases is available via the Strava app, which is a workout tracker. And along the lines of military, we have issues like Silicon Valley types are helping military people use artificial intelligence and machine learning for uh, military purposes. This has been going on for a very, very long time, to be honest. But um, Google doing it was kind of like a big news item because Google had always had this very public image where its, mor its moral statement was do no evil and a public image that it wasn't going to participate in military things until the kind of don't be evil slogan was dropped without really any fanfare uh, somewhere around the time like 
2016, 2017, right? And now, now like every other big tech firm, Google is engaged in military research. So there's questions of, for instance, in ethics, now, not that I'm telling you not to work for the military. What I'm saying is you have questions about the programs you're going to be involved in. It's not just how they can be executed, but do you want to be involved in a particular project? Okay, so that's the point I wanted to make by bringing that out. Um, and it, the, the hits just go on and on. You may remember the Cambridge Analytica scandal from the 2016 election. I'm not gonna go into details on that. There is now increasingly this facial recognition um, software is getting good enough and fast enough and ubiquitous enough that many of the potentially dystopian nightmares that have been written about in science fiction for decades could, with a bad twist of fate, actually be implemented now. Um, and then we also have questions of algorithmic fairness, right? Uh, when a, when an algorithm is trained on uh, how to successfully predict the best candidate for a job, it's working on historical data. Historically, programmers have been men. It has been an unfair bias, right? It's not that women can't or uh, be good programmers. It's that it was a men's club. So when you train an algorithm on the history of who's been hired for top programmer positions, and then you ask it to predict on new recruits who it should hire, you can see where it came up with that. So the problem with all this is that it is never ceasing. It is going to happen again and again and again. The problems are, I would call them endemic, right? Endemic in the sense that we are all fallible humans, endemic in the sense that the data out there has biases and problems built into it. It's endemic in the sense that people are always going to be motivated by different things and something that somebody believes is a good thing to do, other people are not going to. So uh, ethics and data have a lot of interaction and the hits keep coming. That is why we need to highlight to people who are just starting out in data science that your, your task as a data scientist is not just to crunch numbers, it's to think. And it's to think about, in one, on the one hand, whys and hows and the importance of those, okay? as well as the technical details and the analysis and all that on the other hand. So, um, why are these questions being raised about the ethics of analytics and particularly in big data, right? Let's just call back to the YouTube situation, which was an example of how the giant amount of data that YouTube possesses about people's interests can be harnessed into a way which creates uh, difficulty for, for society, okay? And when we get into the ethics of, uh, of things, you can see that there's very quickly that there's, there are conflicting issues here, right? There are things that hopefully are ethical and legal that are within the bounds of what an organization that's driving the project actually wants and technically possible, right? The, even when everybody is a faithful actor, somebody who wants to do the ethical thing, there can be problems when these circles don't intersect enough, when the ethical thing to do is not technically possible or it's not within the bounds of the goals of the organization, right? Or it's not legal. And if your ethical position is not within the intersection of all these other elements, you can have problems and not be able to avoid them, even with people of goodwill who want to do the ethical thing. So this is, uh, if you've never seen it, this is the Google Ngram viewer. It's a really great tool. You can just click on it yourself and go play. You can give the Ngram viewer a word and it goes through Google's database of scanned books. And it looks for the incidence of that word over the years. 
and you can see that um, ethics is something that is appearing more and more frequently in recent years. Okay, it can be fun just to play with that for other things too, by the way. So uh, at this point, I'm going to take a short break and I'm going to come back in a separate video where we're going to talk in depth about a particular case study of ethics and data science. Okay, see y'all soon.